The Art of Yes. Interview with Patti Styles. That's nice. Uh, and I have a little bit of light from the morning sun. You're just waking up? Yeah, almost. Welcome in Warsaw. I'm so happy that my new and next guest is Patty Styles from Melbourne, but originally from Canada, right? Uh, Canada is where I grew up. It's not where I was born, but yes. Ah, so that's the interesting detail. So tell me where you were born then. Uh, I was born in Weehawken, New Jersey. Wow. So I'm an American by birth and Canadian, uh, a raised Canadian. So I'm actually a dual citizen of the U.S. and Canada. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Interesting <laughs> fact. That's great. Uh, so uh, yeah, and now you live in Melbourne. I do, and I'd like to say as we start um, our conversation today uh, that I am meeting you uh, on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging of the tra traditional custodians of Australia. Nice. Thank you for that. <laughs> it's important. Yeah, and especially uh, in the situation which we have now in the world, so... Uh, the situation we've had for a very long time that we're still learning about, still educating ourselves about, and still trying to change for the better of all humanity. Mm -hmm. Good to see you, Patty. Long time no see. Welcome back to Warsaw, because I think the last time we've met, it was Warsaw, Warsaw Festival, I think. Mm. Wow, and that was a while ago. Yeah. Um, Two years? I think, and I had uh, this incredible soup that was really uh, like, um, almost like a fuchsia color, like it was a pink, red, uh, uh, I think Wodnik. a beef. Wodnik, we call it. It's a cold soup. Oh, so good. It was so good. And I worked with your group, and it was downstairs on the, from a restaurant. Yeah, also. Uh, yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, I'm so, so glad that we could meet and I would like to talk with you, of course, about improvisation, but uh, mainly about the beginning and how did you start and your process of learning because uh, we, we talked about a lot of subjects and uh, not so often, uh, teachers, I asked about their uh, beginnings, so I want to dig that subject with you a little bit. So tell me, how, how did you start? How, uh, how did you found improv or maybe improv found you? How was it? I like, I like that you said that you wanted to dig into it. It seems to, to relate to you and your work. Um, uh, I, I, I always knew that I wanted to go into theater. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was in high school in Calgary, Bonas High School, um, I took a class or a program called a work experience. And what they do is um, they ask you what profession you want to go into after school. Mm -hmm. And then they find a company who's willing to take you as an, you know, basically an intern for a period of time. And so the time that you would spend in class, you actually go to that company and you learn mm -hmm. about what it's like. And the Loose Moose Theater Company 
which is the company that Keith Johnstone co-founded, was accepting people for this program. So by the wonderful fickle finger of fate, I signed up for this program and got placed at Loose Moose Theatre, which meant I got to observe workshops, uh, shows, I was allowed to go into rehearsal uh, programs. Uh, I was in the office going through old paper clippings and interviews and reviews. And so I learned the history of the company as I was watching the company work. Wow. As well as watching the shows and everything about the philosophy, the energy, the work that was produced, the voice of the artists, how they challenged the work, how the audience embraced the shows and related to the shows. Uh, just, it, it, it fulfilled everything that I wanted in being a theater artist. So after I finished doing that program, I just, kind of stuck around and started volunteering and serving popcorn and taking tickets and um, and loving every minute of it. Mm -hmm. I, I would be up at the theater every moment I could. And then one day Dennis Cahill uh, came out of the uh, pre-show workshop. So before theater sports, they'd always have a, an hour workshop, which has all different levels of players. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Dennis trained with Keith at the university and was one of the founders of theater sports. And I'm making popcorn and he comes out and he goes, um, do you want to come into the class? And I was like, well, yeah, mm, yes. <laughs> and that's how I started. It was an invitation to join in. My first class, I was with the people who created theater sports and was just accepted as another person learning this crazy and wonderful form. Wow. So, who was, so how was at that time in the Los Mos Theater? <laughs> um, when... When I'm at a festival and having these conversations with uh, other improvisers, I feel like a real oddball. <laughs> because so many people went through levels and had to do this course for, and then take this course. And there was a pass fail. I didn't have any of that. Mm -hmm. um, Every Sunday night, I went to the pre-theater sports workshop and a different improviser would lead it. Mm -hmm. Keith would lead it if he was in town, but if he was traveling, it would be Dennis Cahill or Tony Totino, Rick Hilton, Dave Duncan, Vina Sood, Kathleen Foreman, um, you know, or Frank Totino. And we would work on things. Mm -hmm. Usually we would work on whatever problem arose in the show the week before. That's great. So um, at the end of the show, we'd always do notes. And if there was a common note, um, say, for example, um, most of the scenes were negative or or having a hard time finding endings or variety, then that usually the next Sunday, we would be doing exercises or just one exercise uh, focusing on that. Mm -hmm. But one of the interesting things about the loose moose way of learning was we had the Sunday class, but there was all these other opportunities for learning and exploring and challenging the skills. Mm -hmm. So we didn't learn improvisation specifically for theater sports. We learned improvisation because it was improvisation. Mm -hmm. 
we happened to be performing theater sports, which was a show based on using the skills of improvisation. But at the same time, we were creating shows for children's theater, mm. which had a very clear structure, but we were improvising within the structure. Mm -hmm. But that meant we had to consider what is the story about? What's interesting for a child of five years old? Why, do, why would they watch us? <laughs> um, how to you know, end a scene, to go into another scene, to create a long form, to tell that story. Mm -hmm. How to sculpt it with lights and sound to make it a theater piece. We'd also be doing sketch comedy shows. We would be doing scripted theater, either Keats plays or other contemporary plays or some classic plays. Um, we were doing performance in the, in the parks. So we'd perform in parades. Um, we would do children's theater in a park, which is a completely different environment. Mm -hmm. to learn how to use the skills. How do you engage the audience, keep the audience? So it was this, all of these different elements constantly working. You know, we did stilt walking, we did juggling, mm -hmm. we did clown work, um, masks. Um, we were, theater artists brought together <laughs> because of our, of our love of improvisation. Mm -hmm. And that was the way we worked, but we were exploring how to create theater. So how many hours a week you did? Because it looks like you had something every day to do with, uh, with theater, improvisation and, and, and more. <laughs> Oh, I was up there every hour I could be, I was there. Um, I uh, started, I, I was given the job of running front of house. So I also learned about how to sell tickets and, um, you know, concession. Keith would often come over and watch what we were doing and give us little notes on how we can make it a nicer experience for our customers. Um, I did publicity and marketing for a while. Um, but for me, I was learning about how to produce theater, mm -hmm. how to support theater. All of this to me was a part of creating the world. Um, and it was mixed with, we'd have water fights. <laughs> oh, yeah. Every now and then, you know, you'd, you'd be on stage making something and, you know, someone would come in and hit you with a water balloon or because it was a, a place of creativity and play and trust and openness. You know, we'd have big dance parties on the stage and, you know, we, so many of us had a key to the theater and, you know, we'd be there till two or three in the morning just talking about the show and... It was, I, I'm so lucky that I had the richness of that experience. Mm -hmm. Now I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah. So, and I understand why companies do the levels. It, you know, when you have a lot of students and you need to structure and organize, but there's something about not, having it as uniformed as an education structure, especially when you think of, you know, Viola, Dell, and Keith, none of them were really supportive of the <laughs> hierarchy of the education system. There's kind of a contrast that a lot of impro schools are following that system. Yeah, I understand why logically, but it wasn't my experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, while doing it, th this must have been uh, also a huge community uh, 
building process because if you I mean those improvisers they could pick me up they could throw me around they could jump on top of me that the the trust was um I was going to say the trust was implicit but actually the trust was earned mhm mm um we were working in a supportive environment an open environment an honest environment i mean you know sometimes someone would get angry with someone and the conversation would be had um sometimes something would happen on stage and as a company we would talk about it and debate it but i i don't remember anybody crossing a line with anybody mhm mm um you know it definitely wasn't my experience and even now when i work with those people you know that that first family mhm mm it's there's there's just this yeah uh -huh. you know um and i think that's true for most improvisers your your first group your first company your first class maybe your first team however you define that group there's a it's like your first love yeah <laughs> um, yeah yeah the trust was definitely earned so um hmm so when you when you uh joined uh theater how how was then because <clears throat> i think there uh, there can't be discussion with with you without talking about keith johnston <laughs> because he he had <laughs> apparently some big influence on you uh, and i think not only you but uh, at the th of, of, at theater uh, playwrights and uh, actors and uh, not only people in canada but i think all over the world uh, mm -hmm. where he was teaching how did you meet him the first time and how was it <laughs> what happened when <laughs> well When I started at the theater he was uh in Europe teaching I think he was in Denmark and so I kept hearing his name but I I didn't know who this guy was mm -hmm. <laughs> I had no idea and I was just so thrilled and happy with everything that I was doing and then one night uh at theater sports this man showed up and he you know came through uh into the back uh area where the green room and the rehearsal room was and people knew him and were saying hi to him mm -hmm. so i was like oh okay you know they know this person and i was still new enough that i didn't know everybody nor did i assume that when he he had this green um winter's coat on um in canada we call it a parka i don't know if other people call it that and he had this uh paper bag and in the paper bag he had a box of tissues and i think some pages of a script or something and i remember going this person is fascinating but strange that I, i couldn't place why they were there uh so we did the show and um we all came uh back into the green room area uh while the the group that was um striking the stage were doing that before we went for notes and i was standing in the doorway just kind of listening to everybody and keith came and stood next to me and he goes do you see the three people on the couch i was like yeah and he said i'm going to go and sit between that woman and that man when i do she's probably going to turn towards me cross her right leg over her left he'll probably leave or he'll cross his other leg away from me i was like what and he walked over sat down and that was exactly what happened mhm mm and then someone said hey keith how was your trip and i went uh, oh oh okay I think I have something to learn. Um and I I've, I've always been fascinated why he decided to say that to me. 
but he would frequently do that. You'd be, you know, eating your lunch or watching a show or running lights. And he would come in and ask a question or say something and then just leave. And you'd go, what? And then about a year later, you'd go, oh, oh. <laughs> um, so, you know, he saw me watching people and engaged in a conversation about watch what happens when you watch people. Mm -hmm. Wow, like meta, meta, meta thing, right? Yeah, um, but that was my, my first meeting of him. And then the following week he took the class and that's when I first started meeting him as a, an impro teacher and hearing his voice and the clarity of what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. I will come back to that, but I just had a, a question. Do you remember your first show? Like first improv show? Was it before Keith or was after this lessons where, where, where it could be? <laughs> I think it was after, um, I don't remember the first show. I remember the first, when I was asked to do the first show, but I don't remember the show itself. Uh-huh. Um, because it, the, the system of how you got on stage was you'd be taking the Sunday night workshops before the show. And at some point someone would invite you if, if people enjoyed working with you in class, mm -hmm. um, if they saw that you were, you know, giving your partner a good time and listening and being supportive, um, if, if you were someone that it looked like you would be safe and fun and inspiring to work with, then someone would invite you. Wow. So how did it, how long was the period between you started, uh, you know, this adventure with, with Blue Smooth and then workshops and then the show. Like, this was a period of uh, time of like months, weeks or more. When I, when I was the work experience student, um, I was around the theater a lot, but I wasn't doing the classes. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, um, I think, two or three months I was doing that. Um, and then I when I started coming and volunteering, then I was invited to do the class. Um, I think I was first asked maybe two months after. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that long, um, but the, the show Theater Sports at the beginning has a 10 minute show, like a 10 minute game. And that's for newer players to start trying and learning uh, and other newer players would be the ones that would, you know, put their hand up to captain a team. Mm -hmm. um, then, you know, you play that for a while and someone finally, you know, kind of invites you to go into the next part of the show and then someone invites you into the next part of the show. And, um, but I think it was a couple of months. It's, in many ways, it's all just a, a beautiful scramble of happy goo in my brain like just flashes of moments and memories. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it sounds like quite organic, you know, that it was like, you know, in the process, but also not like, okay, we, we end the, the level or, you know, the class and then there is a show, so no stress in the end, because I guess you, you, if you would say, I can't or I'm not prepared or I don't want, then you don't do it, right? Yeah, and that would be absolutely fine. If someone said, do you want to play? And you were like, oh, not tonight. Or, ooh, I don't think I'm ready. They go, cool. Mm -hmm. There it, it wasn't the pressure. Um, but also, you know, uh, Keith was very open about that. He said, you know, why should he cast the show? Because uh, when he's teaching, he sees a certain perspective of what the student is doing. Mm -hmm but he doesn't know what it's like to be in a scene with you. Someone improvising with you is having a different experience than the teacher that's observing you. And he said, and also my opinion isn't the only opinion or the right opinion, it's just an opinion. 
Mm -hmm. So other people can see something in your work that I'm not seeing. So if the only way you're going to get an opportunity is because of one person, that gives that person a lot of power. Yeah. And, you know, um, the artistic world is very subjective. It's, there isn't one point of view. There isn't one opinion. There isn't one voice. There isn't, it's not a right or wrong um, world. Mm -hmm. So he didn't, he didn't want to have that power and he didn't think he should have that power because he, he knows that there's people, the way they perform may not be his cup of tea. And why should they be held back? Mm -hmm. So it was really organic and not a perfect system, absolutely not, but a very different system um, to what a lot of uh, schools and companies and groups use now. Um, and there's always pros and cons. Yeah, yeah. And also sometimes no other possibilities. Like, you know, when, when in the place where I live, we have schools and there are levels. But when I started, there was like, you know, one teacher and, and that's it. So there was no much uh, of the choice. And, uh, and it's changing and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's growing now. So there are different, mm -hmm. but, but I think the biggest difference is that you could have one teacher for longer period of time. So they could really get to know you and not comment all the time on one thing, which you uh, should improve because they knew that sometimes it's this or sometimes that. So they could mm. see the whole overview of one or many students they, they taught in the same time for longer period yeah and i think for us because we were also creating all these other shows and working together in so many different ways we saw each other in a lot of different environments mm -hmm. um you know so being in the writer room with someone to being in the rehearsal room with someone uh to performing a scripted piece to working out the rhythm of a kid show, to being in a class, you see a lot of different elements of how a person works. Yeah. And we're exploring a lot together. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think there's, um, I think there is a problem when there's too much status uh, given to a few people in an impro organization. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a difference between um, status, power, and control, and um, having a, a structure and a job and um, a flow mm -hmm. of what needs to happen. And um, yeah, one, one uh, can create a, um, a potentially negative environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, tell me how uh, how was your way of uh, learning? And because sometimes when uh, when I uh, was on your workshop, uh, it happened I think minimum few times that you mentioned that we are not always perfect, and you had also these moments where you doubt yourself and so on. Not many teachers, that's really my experience, not many teachers say that aloud uh, on the workshop. It's not that they have to, but you know, sometimes it comes and this is a very supportive way, f a way for students to feel like, okay, we are not alone and the, the, the masters we learn from, they also get through this way, which, you know, we, we watch people like you and we think like, yeah, they good, they never suffered, you know? <laughs> so how, how for you, what was the, uh, what kind of difficulties you found in in your way what helped you and i always ask about epiphany so you know this is yeah that's my english <laughs> <laughs> but i i love the word epiphany <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i love that because in improvisation often those epiphanies come at a time where the story either in the moment or after is quite funny so i actually think you've created a beautiful new word 
Hmm. Oh, I could get myself in trouble with this. Sometimes I tend to be too honest and then afterwards I have people go, you know, <laughs> Patty strange. Um, I would be suspicious of any teacher who didn't have moments of questioning their work. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not talking about being riddled with doubt, but the art form we do is constantly shifting and changing. And every time you're in a workshop room or a classroom, it's you know a different environment with a different group of people, or even if it's the same people, it's a different day for them. So the variables are always changing. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what we learn as improvisers is what's the offer, use what's there and be adaptable. Mm -hmm. So in that world of being present, seeing what's present and being adaptable, you are shifting and changing and using your impulses. And sometimes you're taking a gamble and going, oh, I think this student needs this. And sometimes you're going to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's the nature of the beast. Um, improvisation is not an absolute. I do not believe in impro rules. Mm -hmm. Because when something is called a rule, it means it must be obeyed or there's consequences. Well, what? <laughs> Because the minute you say that, you limit other possibilities because you're telling people don't think of other possibilities, follow a rule, um, which is a whole other thing. Um, as humans, we're, we are imperfect. And that's part of our, the beauty of who we are. We simply are. Even if you go to say something that you've said a thousand times, there could be someone in the room that hears it differently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the possibility for mistake and error, confusion, mishap is there. I think ignoring it, denying it and avoiding it is blocking an opportunity to learn and be human. Mm -hmm. But to step into being comfortable with being uncomfortable, it's a big leap of faith. Um, it does mean letting go of ego. It does mean acknowledging that you, you don't have the status in the room. You're equal with everybody in the room. My job in that moment may be teacher, but my identity in that moment is not teacher. My identity is human. <laughs> I've just been very fortunate to have some experiences that might be useful, mm -hmm. a point of view that maybe in sharing can help people learn. And I want to offer that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, one of the biggest obstacles to learning improvisation is fear. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to be honest as a teacher when I screw up. It gives permission for everybody to screw up. But that means it gives permission for us to try something new. And then we can learn something new. Mm -hmm. And that's really exciting. Um, epiphanies or epiphanies. Um, I like that epiphany. Uh, very funny. I do. I, I, an epiphany. Um, I remember uh, once playing on a, a, a theater sports team, a 10 minute team. And myself and my, my teammates, we had such a great idea. Oh, we were going to play a death in the minute. And we had it all thought out. 
we, we had music cued and we were going to be fans of this band and we see the band member and we die of excitement. Oh, it's going to be hilarious. No. <laughs> um, it was a really bad scene. It was, it, it was painfully bad. And I learned a lot from that. One, planning, the preparation, the here's a great idea, isn't it going to be funny, does not serve you in improvisation. Mm -hmm. What serves you is the moment. And when we brainstormed that and had a laugh, that moment was now gone. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so that helped uh, teach me to let go of planning and just be. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a moment in a scene with Jen Derbyshire. Uh, and she was a more experienced improviser. And I was new and I was terrified to work with someone who was um, really bold and wonderful on stage. Um, a real similar energy to, to Jill Bernard, that beautiful, fearless energy. And she was a dentist and I was in the dentist chair and I was thinking to myself, just, just accept, just accept. And she kept doing things and I would just accept. And then she looked and she went, don't you have an opinion? Don't you have something to say? <laughs> and I went, oh, right. I can't just ride on someone's coattails. Mm -hmm. um, contribute. Don't yeah. be afraid of failing, contribute. She's got me, it's okay. Uh, so that was another epiphany. Um, I had a moment uh, again in a theater sports show where I ran on stage and Kate Keith said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm about to do. And he went, you know what you're going to do? And I went, yeah. And he went, get off. <laughs> and I ran off and went, yeah. Yeah, I was planning, yep. Um, but you know, for some people, they're gonna hear that story and think it's horrible, and it wasn't. It was said with joy and a twinkle and a laugh. And, you know, and then later he set me up in a scene. Like, uh, it was fine. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a good learning. Um, so, so many. Oh, I, lessons coming all the time all the time. Mm -hmm. um, every time I teach, I learn something. Every time I step on stage, I learn something. Um, that's the beautiful thing about our form. So what is challenging after all these years for you still on the stage? Because you're, you're so experienced and you had, you know, this times of like doing improv every day and experience so much that most of us like people like me can't ever get to that level because of I don't know hours of doing this you know like I can't I can't improvise every day for two three hours and being in the theater mm -hmm. so what's challenging at the moment or if there is something first don't I, 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 I really want to say this <laughs> Please don't equate your improvisation by anybody else's. Okay. <laughs> Everybody's experience is their experience. Everybody's opportunity is their opportunity. Um, how many years you do it does not make you a good or bad improviser. Yeah, that's true. How many classes you take don't make you good or bad. Um, I've seen people who within two or three classes are improvising at a level that I go, wow. Mm -hmm. But then two years later, it's like they can't improvise again. Mm -hmm. Everyone is unique. That's so, it's so powerful in what we do that each one of us brings our stories, our humanity, our morality, our individuality to the stage. Time does not define skill. 
experience and time help to give more opportunities to work, but it doesn't define skill. Yeah, yeah, but it gives a bit, yeah, the experience, that's what I meant. It gives like, you know, this bigger platform to, uh, mm. to know more. <laughs> but you could have, if, you're, if you've been uh, improvising for five years and three years of that have been in a negative environment, five years means nothing, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but I do hear often, you know, a lot of improvisers, especially at festivals, students wanting to say, you know, that group of people, they're the masters or the gurus or, they're the ones that know how to do it. No, we don't. <laughs> We're all frauds. Um, we, we, we have what we've learned, but we're as vulnerable to success and failures as anybody else in any given moment. Mm -hmm. In many ways, sometimes the more experienced you are, the harder it is because you've learned all this bag of tricks and you know you're now being introduced in a show as someone that's experienced and that brings with it a lot of pressure so you actually have to push against it and go no it's still okay for me to fail it's okay for me to make mistakes because mm -hmm. that's where the real impro is is when you're riding on that line um but nobody should value or devalue their own work by anybody else's we should all learn from each other. Um, challenges? Oh, oh, so many. Uh, there's, there's often moments in a show where you feel <clears throat> so absorbed in the absolute present moment where everything is effortless and alive and things are happening and words are coming and you're you're seeing things in a, in, in a, a different level of clarity to be able to capture that continually or to be able to have a show where everybody was in that zone to see what's after that mm -hmm. or what's the possibility of that. Um, to create improvised work that truly connects with and inspires audiences that are not improvisers. Um, there are not a lot of impro companies whose audience base is purely the public and have a continual sold out show from the public. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's so much to learn there. And when we perform for non improvisers, it diversifies our work, the suggestions we get what they consider acceptable or not acceptable, what moves them or doesn't move them. Mm -hmm. And that could be laughter or tears. Um, to, to develop, to find out the what comes next of all of this. We're in a real pattern right now where we're just repeating what we know. Um, we're repeating it with like a little fancy hat or a little bow tie. We're, we're not really creating a lot of new. Mm -hmm. And there's another comment Patty's made that I'll end up getting emails going, you're being negative. Um, I'm not, it's, it's, there's a lot of people doing genre, but they're doing the same genres mm -hmm. and they're doing the genres in the same way. And that's fine. I'm just interested in what else? What's, what are the other possibilities? 
Because when you're dealing with an art form that is about making things up, we have limitless, limitless possibility, limitless potential. But I think to get to the what comes next, it requires a lot of honesty, mm -hmm. a lot of calling ourselves on our own bullshit. Um, a lot of us exploring, experimenting, and failing as we learn. Putting the work in front of ego. But I find all that exciting. Mm -hmm. So is this difficult to find people who can do that? Because it requires to have a kind of group which will follow the same desire, I think. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, in any art form, especially any group art form, I think you're looking for artists that connect with something. Um, and that something could be direction. Uh, it could be approach. It could be value. Um, but you have something that that's your creative objective that you all agree, this is what we're, we're doing. And those people can have a lot of different ideas, but if you have this one agreement, mm -hmm. then that's why you're together. Um, you know, if you wanna, if you wanna do a, a variety show for kids, you might have a magician and an aerialist um, and a musician. So those are three very different skill sets, but they agree that it's a variety show for kids. Mm -hmm. So um, the work will fit that. Um, I think, I mean, the challenge I think is to find the opportunity for people to explore for the sake of exploring, not explore for an outcome. Mm -hmm. Classes, a lot of them have an objective or an outcome. And of course, people are coming to learn. There's always, you know, um, an outcome. But I, I had an experience in a class um, I've been teaching online and we're talking a lot about um, technical work of improvisation. And one of the students said, it's a shame we don't get more technical work in our class, that we don't have these discussions. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, there's the problem is that Often when people come to a class, they come because for two hours they want to play and do. Which is fine, absolutely. But it's a different headspace to coming to learn and explore. Mm -hmm. And I would go to classes at Loose Moose and for the hour or two hours, I may never have got up but I would have learned so much. And my point of going was I wanted to learn. And I'm not saying you don't learn by doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but there is a different headspace that I want to go and play and I'll learn, or I want to go and learn mm -hmm. whatever that learning is. So getting people together just to explore without an outcome or a projection or a show, that's often challenging. Because mm -hmm. we live in a society that's all about what are you producing? What are you doing? What are you achieving? Yeah, what's the goal and what's the show at the end or something like that? Yeah. So, so what was the last was time you, you had this? Sorry. What, what was the last time you had this like chance to uh, ha have this experience with friends, uh, which were exploring with you? 
<laughs> um, well, I've, I've actually uh, privately asked a, a few students here if they would join me online so that I could try ideas. Because uh, teaching online is a new thing. And, and I want to, you know, I go, does this work? I don't know. How does this feel? And if we try that, what's your experience? Mm -hmm. And boy, I've been failing. Wow. <laughs> Which is great. I've gone, here's a great idea. No, that was real crap. Um, but it's great. I just kind of circle it or put it on the think about it later list or I just cross it off. <laughs> um, the last time in a room together exploring. Mm, it's been a while. There was a, uh, a few years ago, um, I um, had some people come together just to explore ideas and I um, found a venue that was really cheap and we basically had like, you know, two lights. Um, and we didn't do a lot of advertising. I was, I was happy if only 10 people came. Um, the idea was to try ideas, mm -hmm. just to explore things. Um, and then, you know, I'd ask the audience about what they thought or what was their, you know, like just to learn, just simply to learn. And uh, it was really good because out of that exploration, which longer than a few years ago, um, the show Momentus de la Vida was born mm -hmm. um, and the long form Western that I do was born. Because when improvisers get together to, to share and create and explore, to challenge ideas, to try something in a shared environment with trust and openness, without a status block. Wow, there's so much power potential in that room. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been invited into other groups rehearsal processes and which is always a great honor. And a little bit of my impro soul kind of goes, hmm. when I hear someone say, hey, I saw this show at a festival and it was really successful. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. Like copy, make a copy or. And the reason my impro soul goes, hmm, is because they want to copy it because it was successful. They're not inspired because of the theme or the idea or the presentation or the energy or the the content or the flow or the approach or the dynamic or, because it worked. Mm -hmm. That's not the way I approach improvisation. Mm -hmm. And it's completely fine for people to do however they need to do it. Um, yeah. And this reminds me, uh, some stories from times of learning with Keith, because I remember, uh, uh, I think also you telling the stories where you put like things to do on the stage or changing the clothes, you know, just getting inspired during the show, before the show, during the rehearsal. Um, so coming back to that times, how Keith influenced your improv and I think also influenced you as a human a lot. So what did you get from him in both these areas? Hmm. Um, Keith is often trying to inspire ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he would do things um, in a meeting he, where he'd just throw out ideas. And if it didn't inspire, he'd throw out another and he'd throw out another. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, he wasn't possessive about the ideas. So 
he might go, well, have you tried this? And you go, oh, and you go, well, you could try this. <laughs> because he'd hear that. Um, he would um, look for ways of, of uh, you know, making the stage dynamic. Uh, I mean, we, we, at one point at Loose Moose, we had uh, like a, um, a little car that had a steering wheel that wasn't attached to the car, but we had a steering wheel and this frame and you had to do like Flintstone with your feet. <laughs> but, you know, you'd say, hey, do you want to go to the beach? And this car would be rolled out. <laughs> and, you know, you'd be playing with this toy. Um, we had a swing that came down one night. <laughs> and so I'm on stage swinging, doing a scene with Dennis Cahill and looking at the audience as I'm swinging towards them. <laughs> They're all doing this. Uh, we had a trap door in the stage. So you could be on stage and suddenly you see the middle of the stage doing this under the, cur uh, the carpet and you'd roll the carpet back and the door would open and out would come oh. someone. <laughs> um, it was ways of stimulating the imagination so that you were in the world of possibility all the time. Um, when we did uh, Mutiny on the Bounty, Keith, uh, the adaptation of the story, we took all the curtains down in the theater and we turned the stage into a ship. So the rigging behind the curtains that you would use to go up and hang the curtains or do lights was now upper and lower deck of the ship. Mm -hmm. And the trap door, because it was a trap door backstage, you could go down and come up and go up the ladder and across. And we had a rope that we would bring down and attach to the stage so you could climb up ropes and down. And then we would, we would uh, there was one scene where when we were going around Cape Horn, Cape Hope, forget now. Um, and there's a big storm that the bounty is facing. We gave the front row of the audience water pistols. So as we're all on stage rolling back and forth and screaming and Captain Bly is doing this monologue, we're getting squirted with water guns. <laughs> That's great. And, but it's just a way of how do we inspire people to, to engage in this world that we're doing? How do we get the audience involved in theater? I bet there's audience members that still talk about that show where they got a water gun. I would. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's that same thing that we do f with each other on stage. Mm -hmm. How do I light you up? Um, and Keith was always playing with these toys to figure ways on a personal level, the notes he would give, the side coaching, he would side coach in a way where he would say, you know, say this. And then when you say it, you feel the scene change. But you did it. Mm -hmm. Even though he gave you the thing to do, you feel it happen. So it's, it's a richer learning, I find. Um, in life, he's playful. Um, you know, you, sometimes when you were driving with him, he'd go, well, the car wants to go this way today. And you're like, what? <laughs> and you're off and going somewhere else. And you're like, okay. Um, <laughs> You know, or he'd leave little notes or there was a piano in the studio and sometimes before class he'd be in there playing. And if he came and he went, hi Keith, he'd go, come sit. And you'd sit and you'd just play piano with him. I don't know how to play piano, but now I did. Mm -hmm. Because whatever I did, he would make it sound good. Oh. Um, there's a spirit in our work that's more than a, an applied technique or a rule. 
there's a deeper thing that we buy into that requires us to be very vulnerable and open and have that trust with each other to get there. But when we do, when we can really truly lift our partners up and inspire them, when they soar in that creative moment, that possibility, that wonder, when you can spark that in someone, and then take all of that and be able to put it into something that does that for the audience. <laughs> there's the challenge, there's the joy, there's the carrot I'm still chasing. Um, yeah. I don't know if I've answered your question, but you set me off this beautiful memory lane of Keith. There's and some so stories. Some stories coming to mind that I'm going, I don't think he'd like it if I told that. <laughs> <laughs> this, there's this saying, I think we once talked about it, but I don't know who said it and what's the origin of that. But there is this saying between improvisers that if Keith had a daughter, you would be the one. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's, that's lovely. Um, I take it as lovely because of the people connecting with me with Keith that way. Um, look, he, you know, he is my, my impro teacher. Um, many people have taught me. I've learned from many people. So he's not my only source of learning. Um, but his philosophy and his techniques are the ones that, you know, bring me joy. Um, but I also, you know, Keith is, is a friend and, and an amazing man. Um, he's an intellectual. He's um, the knowledge he keep, keeps in that brain is astounding. Mm -hmm. um, his playfulness, um, his way of looking at the world. You know, um, he was told at one point he might go blind. So he starts learning how to draw faces. Mm -hmm. um, he kind of approaches everything that comes to him as an offer. Okay, if that's the reality, what's the possibility? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, and not to say that he's any, you know, uh, Christ-like being that he's infallible. Not at all. Oh, he can be cranky and opinionated and <laughs> as we all can. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, for me, he's a very, very special person in my life on many levels. Mm -hmm. I remember also one, one thing, but I, uh, I might mix that up. Uh, so you can correct me. Is there some story that he gave you one of the books? Uh, I think it was like a Zen book or something like that. And it mm. keep coming back to him and he asked you if you read it or what? Can yes. You, can you I was going to get it, but it's too high up for me. Um, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. <laughs> oh, no. First, first he gave me Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, and then he gave me Zen and the Art of Archery. Uh -huh. And I read Zen and the Art of Archery. And I said, and I kind of read it and went, well, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> and I said, I've read the book. And he went, isn't it hilarious? <laughs> and I went, oh. And he went, ah, maybe read it again. <laughs> okay. So I went back and I'm reading because now I've got an objective. I'm reading it for the jokes and nothing's coming, right? <laughs> and then I think, okay, wait a minute. Maybe he's doing the opposite. <laughs> yeah. So I go back and I go, Keith, that book wasn't funny. And he goes, oh, I found it hilarious. <laughs> Especially when he first gets the, the bow. Uh -huh. Okay, hang on. <laughs> so I go back to the book and I'm reading the book again. And 
I started getting frustrated with myself and I went, hang on. I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to be right. I'm try like, just, just read the book. And when I said that, I realized I was almost saying exactly what's being described in the book when the person is learning how to do archery. And I went, okay. <laughs> Yeah, it is funny. And when I think of what I was doing at the theater at that time, when I was starting to direct and so forth, I really started doing outcome over process, product over what's happening. So it was also a nice little, here's a book that might remind you <laughs> about some other things. So I, I keep it and I remember that story dearly and I still pull it out and read it. <laughs> now I've, I, I heard the full story of, uh, of the uh, book uh, and it's a great story and yeah, improv is like Zen uh, or can be, uh, let's yeah. say like that. It can be and that's a good approach to go in that direction. Um, but I will still dig a little bit of uh, Keith uh, Johnson approach because I think that um, what he is uh, or what he was teaching and what I think it's sometimes forgotten or even not so let's say I don't meet that uh, that things so so much is like doing mask playing on status and storytelling. I also had my discovery with his book when uh, he, he wrote this chapter about blocking. And you know, it took me a long time to find out that this is a, not blocking and blocking your partner, but this is a blocking the story going forward. And I was like, oh my God, right, that's the thing. So um, can we discuss a little bit like, uh, what's approach of, Keith and you, because you teach this as well as a storytelling uh, um, workshop. Uh, what's the story and how to teach it and what's important in that and why we block and how to unblock and push the story forward? Oh, wow, I really good questions. Um, <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's good. Cause she's like, wow. Um, first, I mean, I, I can only share what I've learned okay. and where I'm at um, and what I've learned from Keith. I'm not his voice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, so when we, when we first start learning to improvise, we have a, a, a big fear of failure that we're not going to be creative enough interesting enough, funny enough, that we're going to be excluded from the group because we're not doing well. Mm -hmm. So at a beginning level, we're teaching acceptance so that other people feel the benefit of that acceptance. If, if you learn that creativity is just creativity, ideas are just ideas, um, that you're brave enough to contribute and that the other improvisers are going to support you. Then we're teaching someone to relax, to contribute, to be present. And that's really important. When we're creating stories, we're looking at acceptance and blocking in, in a, we're, we're adding on a, a slightly different definition or maybe a secondary definition because when we're telling a story improvisers tend to avoid making things happen because when something happens we have to go to the what comes next and that's scary and usually the what comes next deals with people being changed. There's consequences, there's outcome, there's a result of the action. Mm -hmm. And like in life, 
we often don't make decisions because we're afraid of what happens after we make the decision. And we drive ourselves nuts in the not making the decision. Where if we just made the decision, we could deal with whatever comes, right? So it's very similar in improvisation. There's a lot of um, scene work where people feel something's happening, but there isn't anything happening. Mm -hmm. um, and if you were to write the dialogue out on paper as a play, a lot of it would be cut because it's just recycling and recycling. People going in circles because they're afraid of moving into the next step. Mm -hmm. So blocking in that is blocking the, the forward movement of the story. And that block can sometimes be the word yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is where it gets confusing. So when you're being taught as a beginner, you're often taught to say yes or to accept. In some schools, you're taught yes and. But when you're making a story, sometimes the yes will block. <laughs> and so a lot of beginners moving into the intermediate stage get very frustrated because what they've been taught suddenly isn't working. Mm -hmm. And they're hearing these words acceptance and blocking, but it's being used slightly differently. So what we're trying to do is make the story move. Mm -hmm. And that means sometimes opposites apply. If someone says, don't come near me, you take a step towards them. Um, but people would go, hang on. They said, don't come near me. I should agree and go, okay, I won't. Mm -hmm. But then the story doesn't go anywhere. We avoid the, the dramatic conflict, right? Yes. Um, so we have to look at what, how does the story move? Don't come near me. What does everybody want you to go near them? Why? Because we want to see what will happen if you do. Mm -hmm. And what are the consequences of that, right? Absolutely. And that's why improvisers won't. Don't come near me. Okay, then. <laughs> and now it's going to be three minutes of talking about why don't you want me to come near you? Mm -hmm. Where if you took the step, we could find out. Mm -hmm. um, and each story is going to require using the tools in a slightly different way. There are many different types of cars and they're all cars, but the engines are slightly different and they have different speeds and different benefits. Some can carry more people, some can go faster, some are great off road. And stories are kind of like that. A love story will have different elements at play than an action adventure scene. But the principles of making the story happen are the same. Mm -hmm. And if you're thinking, well, how do I know what needs to happen? It's kind of, what's the audience's curiosity? That's usually the door. What are they interested in? Go there. But storytelling when you're developing narrative and story can be a little bit different in structure than sketch. Mm -hmm. uh, a comedy story kind of lives between the, both worlds a little bit. So sometimes people are using a screwdriver when they need a wrench, you know? Um, and in my example, I just want to be clear, in my example of don't come near me and the person taking a step, 
the person taking the step is doing so, watching their partner very clearly to make sure that when they said, don't come near me, they weren't communicating, I'm, I, me, not the character, me, am afraid. But if you're really present in the moment, you will tell. And if you take a baby step, you will see in their response and you can always take another option. Mm -hmm. So when I say follow the story, underneath that is always implicitly look after your partner. Mm -hmm. Just in a podcast, people might go, oh, you said don't come near me. Boom. It's like, no, 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 don't take it as an absolute. It's an example of a moment. Um, if someone said in a scene, tell me you love me, it's a beautiful offer. If I said, I love you, it moves the thing forward. Yeah. If I say, I don't love you, it moves the scene forward. Mm -hmm. If I say, I'm not sure if I love you, it blocks moving it forward. Because mm -hmm. if I confess I love you, we now have consequences. If I say I don't love you, we have consequences. If I say I'm not sure, we're going to talk about it. So for me, the maybe becomes the block. Mm -hmm. This is somehow yeah. called, uh, I think Keith, uh, Keith uh, has a name for that, uh, like wimping or something like that. Yeah, so wimping is um, often um, afraid of taking responsibility in a scene because you're afraid you're going to be wrong. Mm -hmm. So maybes are often indications of wimping because you're afraid of making a choice because you're afraid it's the wrong choice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, wimping also comes out with someone asking a lot of questions, but not questions that are motivating questions or stimulating questions. Questions that are safe questions. What do you want to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instead of, are you going to kill me? which can be a good question. Um, so yeah, wimping can be that. Wimping can also be an energy, kind of, I'm not gonna commit, because if I commit and it goes bad, then I'm, I, you know, I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. um, wimping can come out in things like, um, what's that? I don't know, what is it? That's a wimp. <laughs> Uh, I have a secret. Tell me. Oh, you need to read it on the note. <laughs> and the it's a wimp. <laughs> uh, now, that can also be playful and putting your partner at risk. But if we're looking at how to avoid delaying story moving forward, that's a delay. It's a wimp. Mm -hmm. Do you enjoy play, playing with uh, beginners? Yes. I thought so. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I enjoy playing with anybody who comes to the stage with joy, openness, um, and they're, they're ready to kind of look me in the eye and give it a go. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not interested in good. I'm not interested in tricks. I'm not interested in success. I'm interested in connection, play, discovery. And if you're there with me, I'll be there with you and whatever comes, comes. Um, but if someone's, you know, aggressively trying to, to win or be the star or make it something that they want sure i'll still play with you of course but my impro soul will be taking a nap <laughs> and my my impro technique will kick in no, that's okay 
Uh, this brings to me another subject, and uh, as I saw you doing it, and I love it, uh, you when you play with, uh, or you show how is it to play with somebody who blocks, you can clearly prove there is no blocking. <laughs> uh, so what's blocking? How about blocking? How to learn not blocking or play with that? Mm. Um, so blocking um is denying or refusing to accept an offer that will move a scene forward mm -hmm. right um and it comes in a lot of different ways you can block verbally physically emotionally um you can block the environment um but if you use a block as an offer, then it's hard to be blocked. Mm -hmm. But this means you have to go, I have no future. I have nothing in my mind of where the scene is going. The scene is just happening, which in theory should be where we're at. Um, so um, if, if some, if I started a scene saying, um, I don't know, uh, I love how the tomatoes are growing this year. And my partner goes, um, oh, th those aren't tomatoes, they're cucumbers. Which is a block, right? You, you've denied my offer. And now instead of the story moving forward about tomatoes, we're either going to argue about is it a tomato or a cucumber or I yield to cucumber where they're imaginary. It doesn't really matter what it is. So why do we need to change it? <laughs> right? So in that moment of being blocked, I have options. I can either correct their block and hope that we don't get into an internal struggle Mm -hmm. or who's right. I can just yield and accept it and let it go. If the notes need it after, fine, but move the story forward. Um, you know, or I can use that and embrace that block as an offer. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and in doing that, it could be combining things, just, you know, well, if they said, you know, that's a cucumber. Oh, 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 my eyes. You're right. Right. Now, maybe that evolves into a game that everything I see is not what it is. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and yes, technically I was blocked. And yes, technically I'm doing the work to help my partner. But we help our partners that's what we do. <laughs> and, you know, maybe they didn't hear tomato. Um, but every, everything is an offer. Everything has potential. Mm -hmm. um, our ego will often get in the way and stop us from seeing things with that potential. And that drive for objective and perfection will get in the way and uh, remove our ability to see the potential. Um, we, used to, we used to do exercises with Keith where we would practice blocking, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and to see if you could get away with blocking. Um, partly because anything that you believe is a principle or a tool, you should explore the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, you know, teachers are there to share with you what they've learned. Doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> it might be right for them, but it could, you know, everything that you learn in a class could be a list of things that you should try to do differently to see if it actually works for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't believe blindly. 
uh, which was another thing that kind of Keith would would say. I remember I was uh, talking about something. I wasn't talking. I was I was going rah, 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 <laughs> about something someone had said. And Keith said, well, you know, why, why don't you write a book? And I went, ah, uh. I said, well, Keith, you know, my work comes from your work. And, you know, although I've had experiences other, you know, the, the seeds of this are yours. And he went, but you're very different than me. And you've had a lot of different experiences. And maybe you disagree with me on things and that would be interesting. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you've, you've defined things differently or you've learned something completely different about it. And that, I think of that and I go, wow, you know, with all of the pressure that's put on him because of his work and his name, he's still wanting people to explore the next and find the next. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want the work to go stagnant. And he doesn't want people who are exploring the work to just repeat him or hold him as some icon. It's, you need to challenge it. You need to try it. You need to do it and discover it for yourself. Wow. Yeah, eh? Yeah, right? <laughs> When, when you say, what's the challenge? It's like, everything. But that's also the joy. Yeah. Wow, that was, uh, that was really interesting. Uh, but um, as you know, I talked to uh, Jobil mm -hmm. uh, and I asked him about two things because as he learned in Chicago and his <clears throat> background was uh, obviously based on Viola and Del Close uh, work, but also the others. Uh, and I asked him how he met all the ideas of Keith Johnston and then how he met you. So I have the same <laughs> opposite question now to you. How did you, because you were grounded so much in the Canadian uh, improv, especially at the very beginning and uh, your background was uh, uh, based on what you learned in the Lusmus Theatre and mostly from Keith uh, ideas. So how did you find out the other world, uh, world of, uh, you know, this uh, American improvisation, how that influenced you? That's the one question. And the mm -hmm. other following is how did you meet with Joe and how was your first hour play show? <laughs> yeah. um, so it, it was actually it took quite a while before I was aware of Dell or Viola or any other work. Um, not in a negative way, just being busy doing what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went to a festival and I'm trying to think of what festival it was. Because we used to have a lot of theater sports festivals, mm -hmm. um, a lot, and oh, they were so great. Because um, it was, yeah, a lot of supportive work and play and amazing dance parties and, you know, um, playing soccer games and going hiking and it was just fun things. Um, but I was at a festival where the heck was I? Could it have been Toronto? Might have been Toronto. And I was in a, in a show and I was in a scene with uh, some players from the US from a company that wasn't a theater sports company. And there was a different rhythm. There was something going on that was, I was like, oh, okay. All right, um, but it was, it was different, which is fun, different people. And afterwards, I had one of the players say to me, you just accept everything, don't you? And I went, like, don't we all? 
isn't that the point? And he went, huh. You know, it was kind of a very short conversation. But that kind of made me go, what, what, what was that about? Um, and then I went over and sat with them and I said, so, you know, tell me about your company. And, and that's when I started hearing, I was like, oh, okay, all right. Then doing a bit of research and encountering other companies, other festivals, traveling more, I started seeing this other work. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked Keith about it and Keith knew Dell. Uh, Dell had actually invited Keith to come to, to Chicago and work with his students and they had some correspondence. Um, so that was interesting to hear that. Um, but I mean, I, I, I haven't heard Dell's voice from Dell. So what I've learned about his work has been through other people's interpretation of his work mm -hmm. or students who have worked with them and their interpretation of their experience with him. Mm -hmm. Just like I'm explaining my experience with Keith, yeah. it's my experience. What I'm sharing doesn't define Keith in any way. It's just sharing my experience. So I wish I could have had the opportunity to witness him, like to, to be in the room or to be a student, to feel how he worked. Because it's not just what someone teaches, it's how they teach, what they're trying to teach, what they're exploring. For me, that's all part of the package. And some of Viola, it would, it would be nice to have been in the room. Um, and there's, regardless of where your improvisation work comes from, what, what philosophy, and even if it doesn't follow one of these philosophies, if you're a group that just stumbled upon some games and started exploring your own, what all the work has in common is the spon spontaneous moment, mm -hmm. finding that, discovering that, playing in that, making that available to each other. How do we open that up in each other? Create a safe environment for that to arrive. Mm -hmm. After that, it becomes people's desire and what they're trying to explore. Kind of what we were saying earlier, that what brings you together. So what brought Dell and those students together and what brought Viola and her students together and Keith and his students, those are slightly different reasons working in the same world. Mm -hmm. So it's great that we've got variety and diversity. It's great that we've got different styles and techniques and approaches. Um, does that answer the question about Dell? The background from Keith, it gave you like um, uh, the, the strong shape. So hmm. what was the influence or if there was any from having this American influence on different than based on Keith Johnston. Is there something you can like recall or? The worlds are often seeking different types of work. What I, um, what I find is when I'm reading, um, when I'm reading about more the Del Close uh, approach, let's say, um, through students that have worked with him or students that have worked with students. Uh, a lot of it feels, and this is just for me, not a right wrong, it's just a me. A lot of it puts me up in my head. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and some of the expression, expressions and phrases feel very opposite to what's in my body. When I ask Joe or Wazowski and they define it, I go, oh, okay. But the statement itself, um, for example, 
play to the top of your intelligence. Mm -hmm. When I first heard that, I went, oof, wow, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> like, I went, wow, okay. Every time I go on stage, be smart. I don't know if I'm that smart to start with. <laughs> but when it was explained to me, it's like, no, no, no. Don't, don't go out and do stupid shit. Don't, like, take the audience into account. The audience is intelligent bring what you have, be who you are. I went, ah, that I get. Mm -hmm. That I agree with. Um, so sometimes there's the, the quote, the lesson, and then there's the meaning. Yeah. Um, sometimes talking to people and hearing something that maybe doesn't connect with you is also good because it helps define what does connect for you and why. Um, I think it's, you know, we should all be passionate about what we believe in, but we should be open and curious to what other people believe in mm -hmm. and what can we learn from that. So there are some impro beliefs that are not my beliefs mm -hmm. i just go not my thing that, and that's okay right um but if i'm invited <clears throat> into your show and this is your thing then i play your thing because if i say yes i'm saying yes to that world that style and that's what i commit to mm -hmm. um so yeah, there's been, there's been stuff that's made me think, challenge, reflect, and stuff that's gone, ah, that completely makes me believe what I believe even more. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been some techniques, some games, some approaches that I've gone, oh, that's interesting, you know, or things that I've explored or tried or... I can see what some people are doing now where before there was a style of work that I was going, I, I don't, I don't get what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And now I go, Oh, I can see what you're doing. Great. So that's, that's useful. The first time I met Joe was really interesting because we were in um, Austin, Texas for a, a festival. And I, I had a, a, a couple of negative experiences. Um, I had, it, this one kind of points it out quite clearly. I had uh, an improviser um, from an American company um, walk up to me and go, huh, so you're that Johnstone chick, are you? And I was like, um, so, well, yeah, I, I, I studied with Keith and, and he just kind of looked at me and went, well, we'll see what you can do and walked away from me. Wow. And it really made me feel uncomfortable. And the majority of the improv groups performing at this festival, um, were very, um, Chicago based or anchored in, um, you know, what's the game of the scene? There was a lot of heralds, there was uh, Armando's, there was, you know, the language of, you know, uh, set team showcase, which is not really my language. And that moment made me feel really alien and really excluded. Mm -hmm. um, I was like, okay, okay, okay. Um, there was also a lot of really lovely people. You know, the P-Graph people were, you know, absolutely, you know, delightful. But there was this little, oh uh, yeah, wait till a student of Dell Close meets a student of Keith Johnstone. That's <sighs> gonna be fisticuffs, oof. Wait till we get those two together, which is just, bullshit like anyway so I was sitting at this party 
And Joe walks up to me and goes, I'm Joe Bill. And I went, I'm Patty Styles. He goes, you want a beer? I went, yep. He came back with a six pack. And, and I think we sat there for like three, four hours and just talked. Right. Um, and that was the birth of our play. So when we found ourselves at the Würzburg Festival in Germany, <laughs> and we were given the opportunity to do a duo together, and thank you for our shirts, they're a great treasure. Um, we actually said, you know, it, it's time that the improv world moves past who's right and who's wrong. Mm -hmm. Find what works for you and explore it. And you can change it. And at any time you can add in other things. Just find your joy in the work. So knowing that there's a lot of improvisers at an improv festival, we said, <laughs> if, we, if we did a show where we said the first half, you were going to put me through a Dell experience. And the second half, I was going to put you through a Keith experience. Do you think anybody would be interested? Well, it sold out. <laughs> a room full of improvisers. Um, our rehearsal was the two of us telling stories about how we learned, how we trained, um, which was great. It was, it was such a nice way to learn from each other. about each other's work. Yeah. So, you know, Joe would say, oh, you know, Dell would do this. And I go, oh, Keith would do this. Oh, well, Dell's way of doing that would be this. Oh, Keith sometimes did this. Whoa, <laughs> that kind of stuff. And then we did the show. And working with Joe gave me a really positive way into understanding techniques from the Dell world that I could use. Mm -hmm. And up until that point, I really hadn't been given the experience to explore it. Because whenever I was invited to be in a show where that's how everybody played, I kind of felt like people were off and running and I had to keep up. I, I didn't feel the hand of friendship extended to help me navigate the new world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and okay, people are people, whatever. But Joe made that available. So he was doing ghosting stuff on me and character things and flipping and playing with his toolbox. Mm -hmm. And I loved it because I was being challenged and, and, and I knew he was watching me and he was listening to me and we were intently in the moment together, which is kind of what, where I live. And he wasn't afraid of me playing emotion and he wasn't afraid of change or, or the story going forward. So it felt like the skills actually could complement. Mm -hmm. It's not an either or. They could work together. Um, but there was a moment, sorry, I'm talking a lot. Um, Good. That's great. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> there was a bit of a, a, a defining moment. Um, well, it, it, there was two in that in the, the first half of that show. There was one where Joe walked out and he placed two chairs and he sat and he started talking to the chair. And I knew he was talking to my character, but I wasn't on stage. And he was talking. And I was like, "Well, do I, do I come in? Do I, what, what do I do? <laughs> there, there, there's, there, there's a toy. I, 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 don't, I don't know what to do with it." <laughs> Uh, but he looked happy and he looked comfortable. So there was no reason for me to go in and interrupt it. But then halfway through, he stood up and started to leave. And I went, oh, I think that's the cue for me to go in. But I still didn't know what he was trying to do. So I sat down and I started playing 
the scene, but now from this character's perspective. Mm -hmm. So everything he had said, I was now responding to. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw Joe go. <laughs> and I, it, my brain started going, I'm doing it wrong. I've broken it. I've done something wrong. I don't know what I've done. <laughs> I don't know what this is. Keep going. Afterwards, when we talked about it, he said, um, the, the normal flow of that exercise is he would do the first half of the scene with this character talking. And then this character would come in and continue the scene. Mm -hmm. So it would sound like a continuous scene with, but I came in, so he started the scene. I came in and I replayed the scene from this character's perspective. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because it was kind of showed a little bit of the difference of how our brain worked. Where I went, there's no point in these words until we know the reaction to them. Mm -hmm. Right? So it was just a slight change. Uh, the other moment was when his character uh, got caught out for cheating on me. And I started a scene by folding clothes. I was leaving him. And he's, you know, begging me not to leave and he's explaining things. And I just kept packing and I started to cry. But I would not talk. And there was a moment that I could hear he, he was talking and then he paused. And then he was talking. And I just heard his voice change. And he was talking. And that voice changed. There was a part of me going, you're expecting me to answer. Nope. My character is that mad at you. I've got nothing to say. I'm saying everything I need to say right now. So we talked about that afterwards as well. And he said, you know, that he did feel there was a moment. It was like, when are you going to give me back? And then he went, oh, hang on, you are. Mm -hmm. But it's not words. So those little discoveries were really cool. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then every time we play, our, our only objective is that we don't decide on what we're going to do until 10 minutes before the show. And every time we've played it, we've tried something different. So we've tried starting it different. We've tried different elements of how to play it. We've tried to do um, a one act play. We've tried to do a one act done three different ways. We've tried starting from a physical position in 10 seconds of silence. We've tried just to keep it fresh for us. Mm -hmm. um, in Vancouver, we actually said to the audience, you know, at this festival, you're seeing a great variety of work we don't know what we could add that would be different. So what are five things you want to see us do? <laughs> we just took those five things and tried to build from that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I love that show and there are minimum two online, uh, I think. So uh, uh, I will, I think. Uh, so I will probably post them under this, uh, on YouTube that somewhere there uh, in description of YouTube will be, uh, I hope, uh, minimum one of these links because I think it's really worth to see your show, especially live, but not only. Um, but this goes for me, like, uh, re reminds me about another subject, which is like uh, this difference between uh, American and Canadian, or especially between comedy sports and theater um, uh, sports. Yeah, how, how is it? Comedy, sports, and theater, sport, sport. sports. So, so there's a. Uh, when I talked about it with Jill Bernard, she she said that it's already in the name comedy and theater making the difference. But uh, my experience was I heard someone once saying that they're not interested in Keith uh, work because this is a theater sports. It's just games. 
and you know and that's not much to get out of this when we do loan form uh, mm. so this is you know i don't think it's like very common uh, but uh, to, to say that not many people will say that but it is this voice especially for people who don't know kif uh, work so much and I know that in this theater sports and maestro, there is a second level, a second background, a huge thing about humanity, support, playfulness, and all of that. Would you just explain why that is so special? Uh, theater sports and maybe maestro, like the idea of Keith playing this? Yeah, I mean, um, why it's special for me and some of the philosophy behind it. Look, there are a lot of people who look at theater sports and say, I don't like it, which is fine. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who say, I don't like theater sports because it's all a bunch of games. And to be honest, there are a lot of theater sports companies that that's how they're playing it. So there's truth in that statement. Um, but that wasn't what theater sports was designed for. And there's, there's the, the difference. Um, and look, if you prefer long form genre over games, Herald over theater sports, fine. You know, um, I might differ, but I'm not gonna be offended because someone has an opinion. <laughs> um, so theater sports, I mean, it, it started with, exploring work in the classroom, Keith and his students. Although it actually started in, in England, Keith working with the Royal Court Theater mm -hmm. and doing improvisation work there. So I think it's interesting that people go, you know, improvisation is Canadian or American, where it's not. First, there's a lot of global teachers and secondly, Keith's work actually started in the UK. Yeah. Um, and sadly, there's a, a tradition of improvisation in London that a lot of London improvisers don't know about. Mm. Um, so he was exploring ideas with the Royal Court Theatre. Then they started putting some of the ideas on stage. Um, they would call it a workshop because at that time, any work being put on stage had to be approved before it could go on stage. And improvisation doesn't have a script. But if you call it a workshop, you could put that in front of the public. Mm -hmm. So this um, developed into the theater machine. Mm -hmm. um, and they, so Keith Johnstone, um, oh, I can't remember everybody's names. I'm afraid of saying one person and, and not naming the whole group. Um, but look them up. Because <laughs> yeah. it's, it's surprising. It's um, yeah. Yes. Um, and they would tour Europe and they'd play Master Servant and Over Confessing and Status Games and Word at a Time and developing the work and seeing how the audience was responding to these exercises. So when Keith um, was asked to come to Calgary to be a professor at the university, um, while he was there, he was exploring these games, continuing the exploration with students. And then it was like, okay, the audience enjoys it. What could we do with this? Mm -hmm. How do we form it? And that's when uh, in rehearsal, the concept of theater sports came up. Keith was talking about how audiences get so enthusiastic at sport, but they don't in theater. Mm -hmm. So how can we make theater mean as much to the audience as sport? Um, and from all of that, theater sports is born. The games are exercises and those exercises at least Keith's exercises are usually developed to um, solve a problem. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so they're really good at developing skill and they're often really enjoyable to watch 
because there is an element of the improviser, the human, the struggle to improvise, whatever that struggle is. But we would use games for variety in theater sports. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't endless back-to-back -back games. We would play scenes. We would ask the audience for a story of their life experience or maybe a story from the Bible or something that's happening in the news or a pet peeve of theirs or something in the world they want to correct. Um, and we would improvise scenes. But the games were really good to flow into the evening to give a variety of texture, time, visual elements, a sense of play. So if we just did a long scene, um, you know, uh, confronting Satan about, I don't know, Donald Trump, we might want something a little different after. And that different could be a one minute game because we've just had a three minute scene. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if we've had a scene with one person, we might want to play like one person monologue. We might want to play a game that had eight people running around because changing the visual element and the energetic element of the stage is good for the audience's engagement as well. So the games were variety. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, you know, your salt and pepper in the stew, not your potatoes and carrots and meat. Mm -hmm. But when people started teaching improvisation, people teach improvisation all through the vehicle of games as if improvisation is only games. Um, there's a lot of books where it's about games. Here's a game book, here's a game book. When people ask how to teach improvisation, often they say, what are your top five games? <laughs> and I can't answer that question. because it, it, it changes for the group that I'm working with. Mm -hmm. It depends on what they need. You know, in a way, um, what do they need to learn and what exercise teaches that? Um, theater sports and maestro, when they connect to the philosophy of Keith, and they're played with that philosophy, there's a whole other thing going on. So you could play theater sports and play games and have judges and do scoring. And you're doing the structure, but you're not quite capturing theater sports for me. Mm -hmm. In theater sports, the judges are there to protect the players. It's not about competition. The judges protect the players by being able to end scenes, give the horn, give the basket. The horn is a, we call it a warning for boring. Because that, because for the audience, it's like, what? You know, and let's face it, who wants to be in front of two to 500 people and be told you're boring? Yeah. <laughs> But it raises the stakes in the mind of the audience. Mm -hmm. That's not what I feel as a player. When I get horned, it's my fellow players who I trust saying to me, that scene's not working. <laughs> Let me help you end that. <laughs> we can use that time on something else. And I'm like, thank you, right? Um, but you have to kind of park your ego and trust that your partner who's a judge, they're not horning you because 
they don't like you. Mm -hmm. They're not horning you to judge you. They're going, yeah, Patty, good try. Good try. But not today. No. Not working. Bye bye. <laughs> right? Um, so the horn protects you, it helps you get out of a bad situation. The basket is there in case you say or do anything that's offensive. Mm -hmm. um, we always run the risk in improvisation of saying something and the audience hears it or interprets it in a completely different way. And that, that was not the intention of the person on stage, but there's an innuendo in, uh, implied. Mm -hmm. Um, or an accidental reference made to a scene in another part of the show that that improviser wasn't even in. But for the audience, it becomes a reality. Mm -hmm. And once it's let loose, the audience will always remember that person said that thing. But if the judges give you a penalty and they say, hang on, no, no, Patty, no, you don't get away with that. Monica, no. <laughs> We're going to give you a penalty. Then the audience knows that there's a, that as a group, we have a sense of quality and responsibility mm -hmm. to the audience. And if you've been punished for it, the audience goes, Okay, we release you of your guilt. Mm -hmm. So then when you play again, you don't have that bad smell around you. Yeah. But these elements of being able to recognize that in order for improvisers to play freely and openly, we always run the risk of failure. Mm -hmm. So how do we give improvisers permission to be free, but still protect them in case something happens and make it accessible and safe for the audience? Many groups playing theater sports remove those elements because they feel that the, the horn is negative judgment or they'll make the basket funny or they'll make the judges funny, mm -hmm. but that removes responsibility, authority, playing the status. So it starts complicating the philosophy of it. Mm -hmm. And same with Maestro. With Maestro, you've got 14 people playing and it's quite possible that two to four people might leave after the first round. So you might come to do a show and play for two minutes. And if you're an improviser who's thinking of your stage time only, that will be very difficult. But if you're an improviser that's thinking about your company and your company show, and tonight my role in the show is to be kicked out in two minutes, and you know you're supporting the company and you can still learn from everything everybody else is doing, then it can be really quite fun. Mm -hmm. We used to have bets backstage as to who'd get kicked out first. <laughs> we used to bet each other and it would be, you know, um, whoever gets kicked out first, everybody would buy beer or, you know. <laughs> um, again, because the mentality is, let's give each other permission to take that job instead of forming strategies on how to be the last person. Mm -hmm. The idea of being the last person, that's the entertainment for the audience. We need to work as a, a group mind and a collective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the transition of impro theory and philosophy can get morphed. Yeah. Um, so in the interview you were doing with David, he mentioned that Harold had uh, no rules or no structure. Mm -hmm. I, I can't tell you how many times I've 
heard or seen either a class or a show or talk to a student about the structured herald. Scene one must be this, scene two must be this, scene three must be this. Mm -hmm. And then watch the show where every group has done exactly that formation. So when I hear David talk about there is no structure, and yet I know that there are companies teaching the structure, we can see that somewhere the original point and idea and philosophy has morphed into something other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even the last interview with um, uh, Joe Bill, but made by Randy Dixon, they discuss this stuff and they talk how different is taught now and how they were taught by their clothes. That was very different and there was no structure. There was a lot of things involved and every time they came to the workshop, there was a different idea, let's try this, let's try that. And they, they played Harold, but they always tried something new and new and new. And that was very much the same with Keith. You, you went to a class, but you didn't know what it was going to be about, mm -hmm. except you knew it was going to be about improvisation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Keith might come in with a toy or he had read a book and he's got this idea or um, last week in the show, this game didn't work, let's look at that, or it was, it was always exploring. It, you were being taught through exploration, and you were all having that experience together, which created the bond and the trust. You weren't being taught absolutes. You weren't being told, here's how it works. Mm -hmm. You were being taught Here's what I've learned thus far. Here's what we know today. Yeah. Normally we do this. What if we tried that? <laughs> and and I, I think we're missing that. Yeah. Um, when there's an improv festival and they're selling workshops, students want to book a workshop, but they want to know what the workshop's about. So the minute we do that, it means teachers have to define outcome. Mm -hmm. And I struggle with this all the time. It's like, okay, I have to write a blurb for this workshop. Okay, um, I, I, I know what I can teach, but part of me goes, I'd like to walk in the room and find out what you need. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or what presents. Um, but of course, to, you know, have a bunch of people who don't know you just go, sure, we'll, we'll book a workshop on the, I don't know, <laughs> um, it's hard. So I understand why we need it. Just be nice to find another way. And I don't know what that way is. Yeah. I know what you mean. I know what you mean because I, I study that way. So I choose workshop by the subjects and I know why I go to some of them and I, I don't go to others. Yeah, it's, I think needed. There's a lot of students who are feeling workshop tired. Mm -hmm. They're taking a lot of workshops. They've covered a lot of themes and ideas. They're repeating some of the work. There's nothing wrong with repeating work. You can always learn something new. But they don't feel they're developing. They feel they're developing this, but they're not developing this. And I think part of that is because, you know, we're not having that opportunity to be in a room for a day, a weekend, a week, and go, right, okay, let's get to know each other a little bit. Let's see what's presenting in the work. Ah, here we go. Let's follow that and see what that is. Yeah, and maybe this comes back to this teaching with one teacher for a long time, you know, of this idea where they, they can observe the student and then in the right moment give the right comment and note to, to push uh, from that mm. moment forward. Because this happens in this, this long process with one, with one teacher, yeah? when you work for a week or like 
a month or longer period or like you did and people did with Keith, uh, with, with Keith, with Dell, with Viola. That, that's, that's why for me it, it sounds very different on that level. Although when Keith teaches for a weekend, he goes, okay, what's presented? Mm -hmm. Let's have a couple of scenes, let's, let's try something and then he just follows it. Um, but I think because we trust Keith because Keith has developed a body of work and a reputation. That permission is given. Mm -hmm. um, and people go to work with Keith because they want to see what Keith will do. <laughs> so it changes the consumer brain on how you're booking the workshop. When you're at a festival and you've got you know, between five to 20, you know, interesting teachers from different places in the world with really, you know, exciting titles. You want to try as much from the buffet as you can. But I think, you know, sometimes the learning is about the sitting in it and the doing. And I would say most teachers in at some point in some class in their own way will have felt at festivals a pressure to deliver. Mm -hmm. um, And, you know, sometimes you go, okay, well, you know that people are, are, are altering their lives to make space for the workshop and to travel. And it's, it's such a leap of faith. Like it's, I'm humbled, you know, that, that, that people would come to take a workshop. Um, and maybe, look, maybe people will listen to this and there will be students who think the same and maybe students can talk to festival producers and say, hey, look, we'd be really interested in, you know, a weekend with Joe. And it doesn't have to be defined. We know Joe, David, you know, um, Jill, uh, Inbal, you know. Um, we know their work enough that we trust being in the room with them for a weekend would be an experience enough. Mm -hmm. That would allow the teachers to go, right, it is what it is, whatever that is. If this inspires those teachers, you know. Um, but there is something missing from how our first teachers taught to the um, consumer approach of how classes are being structured now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to me, one of the, the classes like that is it was a master class with you, the, the one which is like three days long, and then the first one or two hours we just play and we see what we need, and, and you see what we need, and you see who we are, and then we start from that. So, uh, doing, doing this. It shows me that this approach is possible, but mm. it has to be will for doing it. Yes, because in that, it does mean there's long times that you're sitting watching other people work. Yeah, or you don't know what you will get, right? Because you go there and you, you, you don't know what's the subject of, uh, of the, the class, right? Yeah, so and... Feedback maybe and side coaching, but still you don't know how much you will get out of that. Absolutely. And, you know, what I'm seeing in those days is still a snapshot. So it may just be where that person is that day or how they're working with that group. It may not be how they play otherwise. But I think that's even interesting because if you've changed your way of playing in this group, why? Mm -hmm. Is this the way you'd like to play? Are you feeling more relaxed, less relaxed, more on guard, less on guard? Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I like doing the master class. It's always fascinating. It is one of the classes that I really am so exhausted afterwards, but really happy. Like happy in the learning and, and feeling stimulated. Um, I would love to be able to have more time and space in it. Um, or maybe less students, but both of those decisions become practical decisions about budget. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and this is the thing, right? The back and forth of how do we make these choices? It's, oh, we are so lucky to do what we do. What brought you to Melbourne and what, how, what, what has changed and how is life now far away from your lovely Canada because you feel Canadian? Yeah, and I, I miss, I do miss Canada. Um, I, d I really miss, um, you know, family and friends and um, things that are comfortable in life there. Um, I don't miss the snow and the cold, I'll admit. Um, I get nostalgic for it every now and then, but I don't, I don't, I don't miss shoveling. Um, I came to Melbourne because I fell in love. Yes. Uh, and um, for a while, Chris and I were dating <laughs> him in Australia, me in Canada. Um, and then we went, okay, we want to be together. One of us needs to make the move. What will that be? Um, and we did it very practically. We wrote out a, you know, pros and cons oh. list. And, um, you know, now I, I, I get to experience the amazing, uh, gum trees and the smell of eucalypt when it rains, um, the lorikeets and king parrots, kookaburras, um, galahs, cockatoos that fly around my outside of my garden, the wild magpies that come to our door every morning and sing for us, and um, the beautiful golden light that appears at dusk. It's a, just a different tone. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm spoiled to live in such a great environment. I'm fortunate to have Canada in my blood and have it there. And I'm blessed to have seen so much of the world as I have. Yeah. Um, so and I will see more at some point. Oh yeah. Uh, everyone wishes this and I wish you that. But how did you meet uh, Chris? Uh, what? Because... We were both performing at the Edmonton Street Performers Festival. Okay, because he's also a performer and artist, and I think clown, cl also clowning. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's a clown. And uh, he was performing at the festival, uh, doing circle shows outside. And um, we ended up in the performer van going from the hotel to the square. And I was roving doing one of my mask characters. Mm -hmm. And Chris saw the mask and he went, oh, do you use a, a mirror to spike or to spark? And I was like, you know what mask, you, you understand. And we just both. Um, and that was kind of our, our first connection. But that festival, we just got to know each other as friends. Then there was six years in between he came back after six years that's how it's coming yeah he came back after six years and within three or four days we connected and six months after that we were engaged Aww. yeah so um it took us six years to figure it out and then once we did we were, we were on it pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> what to wait for. <laughs> so my last, last uh, let's say, last, last question or last chapter is, 
How is it like, what do you do in Melbourne? Because you had to switch from Lusmus Theatre to the completely new world. So is this something you created or you jumped into the structure which was there already? Or you built it? How, how, what, how, what happened when you arrived? Um, well, I, um, I was living in Calgary and then I went out to Toronto for a year. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to Edmonton. So I had had some transitions with different impro uh, companies. Um, and I was the artistic director of Toronto theater sports for a year. Then I went to Edmonton, uh, and I started with rapid fire theater, which was a theater, uh, a sister theater sports company mm -hmm. performed with them. Um, I was artistic director with them for a while, worked with a group there. Uh, we, um, developed dynasty, um, the live improvised soap opera. So I'd already experienced transition and moving. Mm -hmm. And in Melbourne, there's a company called Impro Melbourne, which is a sister theater sports company. Uh -huh. uh, and I had met some of the players at a festival I came to in Australia. Uh, some of them had come to Calgary for a festival and there was a festival in LA. So I knew some of the players. And when I arrived, I said, hey, and they were like, come play. Uh, so I went and played and I got to know the company. Um, after a couple of years, uh, I was asked if I would like to be the artistic director. So I stepped into that role for about five years, I think it was. Um, then left the position, started concentrating more on international work. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was a, a transition in the company and um, there was a player who was interested in being artistic director, but she had uh, no experience. So she asked if I would co-artistic director with her to help train her uh, in some of the skills. So I went back into the, that role uh, as a co-support. And uh, last year I left uh, in the directorship and Catherine is now the artistic director. She's taken full reins, which is great. Um, but yeah, it, it was a relatively easy transition because sister theater sports companies already have uh, a shared mm -hmm. philosophy. It becomes a bit challenging because when you learn from the person who created it and then you go to another group who's developed it differently, finding the shared conversation to talk about the work where it's not you're doing it wrong mm -hmm. and it's not you know, we don't have to listen to Keith, where we can come together as artists to go, ah, oh, you have information that could be useful. We've done exploration that could be useful. Mm -hmm. And to talk about that, um, which we did. Um, and sometimes there was some uh, chunky discussions. Um, some players, um, maybe would still argue some points that I believe that maybe they don't, which is fine. Um, the work here started as it did. It's got a great legacy and history and tradition. Um, and all of that stands on its own, you know, uh, what it achieved and the really strong improvisers that it developed mm -hmm. um, but it's nice to come in and go underneath it all we are siblings of a kind yeah 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 i, I also didn't know the story 
So the, the very last question, because as I said, I could ask you for another two days, but uh, <laughs> we need to uh, wrap up at, at some point and I need to uh, give you uh, time to come back to your <laughs> lovely life in uh, in Melbourne and and uh, your husband and kangoos in the gardens <laughs> yes. on the streets, which sometimes uh, uh, come to. Um, so last question, but a bit um, connected what you've said. Dynasty is uh, an opera soap, and I just uh, read that you were the first ever female improviser who improvised for 53 hours long. Oh my god, how that <laughs> happened, how this is possible, and what's the dynasty then, and why so long? <laughs> uh, dynasty. Um... As as you know, theater sports is is deep within my impro heart. So is Dynasty. Um, and Di Dynasty started with um, a group of improvisers and actors brought together to create uh, an episodic soap opera. Mm -hmm. And so we we do a season. It would start September, wrap up in May, every Monday night we would do a two hour show. Mm -hmm. um, then a couple of years into it, we decided we would do a fringe show. So we do our weekly. Mm -hmm. Then in August, we do one every night for the 10 days of fringe. Then we thought, why don't we try doing a soap-a-thon <laughs> as a fundraiser? And so we would start the show Friday at eight and go until Sunday at 10. And it was great fun. Then one year, Mark Meir thought, I wonder if I could do the whole thing. So Mark had traveled back from London. So he was jet lagged and he was playing um, a female character. So he was wearing high heels and he had a bad back. So not only is he the first person who went the whole distance, he did it in heels with a bad back, not being able to sit for most of the weekend. Oh. Awesome. Wow. So then the following year, I thought to myself, I didn't know that could be possible. I wonder what that's like. So, I went to the weekend thinking, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it. But if I, because I was actually scared. I thought, what if I get really ill or like, I didn't know what my body would do. So I said, okay, I'm going to try it. And I'll just quietly keep going until I feel I can't. Mm -hmm. That was my little promise to myself. And Dana Anderson had also thought the same thing. So we ended up, both of us and Mark, going that weekend. But that year, we actually moved the time starting Friday at 6, going Sunday till 11, because we wanted to extend it for some reason. I can't remember why. Make it longer. Um, and it's, it's amazing. Um, you need to do it with care. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, all of us that do Sopathon, and there's now a Sopathon in London. Um, we've had one here in Melbourne. And, you know, so the week before, all of us, you know, either stop or minimize how much coffee and tea we drink. Um, like we kind of go into training for the weekend. On the weekend, we drink lots of water. We eat small meals instead of big meals. Um, keep moving, keep stretching, um, just so that we do it as safe as we can. But the experience, because at multiple times during the weekend, you're just so tired, you can't worry. Mm -hmm. So you're not thinking ahead. You're not worried about what's going to happen. You're just there 
and it's really cool and the emotions are so vibrant mm -hmm. because when you spend you know two days as a character you're no longer thinking how to respond you're responding <laughs> it's there it's instant um but you also get crazy giggly brain so you'll be in a scene and you just start laughing and you don't know why mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can't stop or you start doing something that you think is amazing and everybody's staring at you wondering what you're doing Some people hallucinate, you know. So two things. One, because this is a word play. Uh, the, the, the name Dynasty is uh, not the dynasty we know from the American movies. It's a yeah. word play. So is anybody dying in this, in this uh, um, idea of this show because of the name? Or it's just the name which is just uh, a game of... Yeah, it was just a fun play with the name, mm -hmm. but it is a soap opera. Yeah. You know, uh, so people can die. Mm -hmm. um, one year we were doing a Western, Big Gulch. And on our final episode, um, we were very fortunate to have an actor by the name of Joe Flaherty come and guest with us. Mm -hmm. And Joe Flaherty um, is really well known in Canada. He's played on um, SCTV um, with John Candy, uh, Catherine O'Hara, uh, Andrea Martin, Martin Short. And um, he came and guested with us. And uh, it was the last episode of the, the season. And I was in a scene with him and I was, uh, my name was Chastity St. Jezebel. And I was the saloon mistress and sex worker. And he was playing um, a preacher man that came to town who had learned about the gold I had hidden somewhere in the saloon. And um, so we start arguing and he goes to kill me, but he backs away because he's thinking, this is a weekly show. I can't kill one of the main characters. And I saw that in his eye and I was thinking, oh, you've got to kill me. It's the last episode. You've got to kill me. So I started insulting him. I started going, you don't have the guts. You're not brave enough. And I just saw him go, <laughs> like, game on, lady. And he killed me. And it was great. It was a really great death. It really showed his character. The audience loved this well-loved, you know, TV star, but hated him for what he did. <laughs> and then I got to play a ghost following him for the rest of the episode. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> um, so there can be death. Can be. So this, like, audience is sitting there like, the for, uh, full time or there are, like, breaks in between or, how, or are they just leaving when they meet and they come back and it's all the... Yeah, it's a combination of all of that. So the show runs an hour 45, then we have a 15-minute break, hour 45, 15-minute break. Um, so we have audience that will come and go, you know, beginning and end of a show block. Mm -hmm. But we will have audience who are there for the whole weekend. Mm -hmm. And so if they need to get up and walk or, you know, go to the bathroom, they just do what they do. One year, we had uh, these four women who came with sleeping bags, pillows, their esky of food, and they were there for the weekend. And the remarkable thing was they had this big notebook. So whenever th two or three of them were sleeping, one would be awake writing notes on what happened. And that was the, the agreement they made was one person always has to be awake. <laughs> we had a reviewer come one year um, 
and he he wrote a review saying it's hard to review a show that's 53 hours if you don't see the whole thing the next year he came and sat the whole 53 hours so that he could review it properly but at one point <laughs> we were on stage and it's four in the morning and we're doing something and we hear <laughs> we're all looking at each other and there's you know maybe 10 audience members and we realize it's the reviewer the reviewers fallen asleep so we all sneak off stage <laughs> and we gathered around him and we all started singing a lullaby to him <laughs> but of course we've got wigs and glasses so he's there and he's like <laughs> and the look on his face when he saw all these mad faces on the top of him. <laughs> anyway. Oh my god. Yeah. That's a lovely story to, to end party because yeah, we were talking more than two hours. Uh, but I, You were wonderful to talk to. I love every second of that mm -hmm. talk. And oh, my heart is melting, and uh, I really love that conversation, Patty. And and yeah, that's that's why I love this project because I can get deeper, I can get to know you, and have this lovely time with you. That's so lovely. Thank you so mm. much. I'm really I've enjoyed it immensely. I've always loved sitting and talking with you, <clears throat> but this provides an opportunity to have that focus of just being together. So thank you for the invitation. Oh, thank you for taking the invitation and agreeing. That was lovely. Ah. <laughs>